Paul, the Apostle Paul understands that unbelief is the greatest obstacle to growth in grace, which is why in this section he prays that the Ephesian Christians would believe everything he's just said is true of all Christians in the, in the verses leading up to verse 15. He says some amazing things about God and what God has done in verses 3 through 14, but he recognizes that everything he just said seems too good to be true. It's just so difficult for us to believe that everything he just said about God, about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, teaming up to save rebels, just seems too good to be true. And so he prays in these verses that the Ephesian Christians and us would believe that all of these things that he said about them and us are true. I mean, it's so easy to believe the statement that God is love. It's relatively easy to believe that statement. What's, what's difficult for me to believe, and I think for you to believe too, what's difficult for me to believe is that God loves me. There's a difference. Okay, to say God is love, I think in one sense is much easier to grasp than to say God loves me. One is theoretical, okay? I mean, one is somewhat ethereal. God is love. And then we leave that relatively undefined. But to say that God loves me is very, very, it's super, super personal. I mean, knowing the mess that I am, okay? It's so difficult to believe that God's love for me is unconditional. It's so difficult for me to believe that God's love for me is unwavering. It's so hard for me to believe that nothing I do or don't do can ever separate me from God's love. I mean, the idea that I can never, ever out the coverage of God's love and forgiveness seems just too good to be true. Okay? That, that doesn't come natural to any of us. If you're really honest about who you are, if you're really, really honest, if you look beneath the surface and you get a good look at the messed upness of your heart, it's very, very difficult to conclude that God loves me. I mean, it's God is love, yes. God may love him, yes. God, God loves Billy Graham. God loves the super saints. God loves this, that, and the other. But God loves me? I mean, seriously. If people around me knew me the way that I knew me, they wouldn't love me. How then can I conclude that God loves me? Okay, it's super difficult to believe in. Paul gets that, which is why he prays for the Ephesian Christians to believe the radicality of what he's just said regarding the nature of God's love for sinners. I mean, my, my forgiveness has limits. I mean, I just, I just intuitively know that there are some things I could do that could potentially forfeit the love of those who love me most. Okay, I mean, I just, I just know. I mean, there are, there are certain things I could do, regardless of how loving and forgiving my wife and my children are, or how loving and forgiving some of my very close friends are, or my mother, or my brothers and sisters. I just intuitively know that there are certain things I could do that would forfeit their love and forgiveness. Okay, there are certain things I could do. There are certain decisions I could make that could forfeit their love and forgiveness. I mean, our love for one another is inescapably conditional. Our love has boundaries. Our love has limits. Okay, we, we decide to go we decide to go so far, and some of us who love the people around us a lot will go really far. But there is a limit, there are boundaries, okay? There are certain things people could do to you, especially those who are close to you, that would make you shut down in your love and forgiveness toward them. Okay, I see this all the time as a pastor, especially in pastoral counseling situations, that there so much hurt is done from one person to the next that the other person has completely shut down 
Shut them out, shut down. At one point they loved them, and at one point it was easy for them to forgive the offending party, but now the limits have been pushed. And my heart is closed toward this person. I mean, our, our love is inescapably conditional. Okay, our, our love and our forgiveness has boundaries and limits, but the idea that God's love has no limits, that it has no boundaries, and that it is directed to me personally, okay, just blows my mind. And that's what Paul does here. I mean, in, in fact, it's so unbelievable that we have to be reminded of it every day, every day. It's so unbelievable. Uh, that God would love the train wrecks that we are because of what Jesus has done, that we have to be reminded of it all the time. I was um, putting Jenna, my 11-year-old, to bed recently, and I asked her as I was putting her to bed, I said, honey, how do you think God feels about you? Okay, And without hesitation, her immediate response was disappointed, immediate. So I probed a little bit to see if maybe she had done something wrong that the Holy Spirit was convicting her about, okay? And as I was probing, I discovered, no, she's not saying that because she's holding something back and she feels guilty because of a particular sin. She just just understands that God is holy and perfect and she's sinful and imperfect, so it makes sense to her that God is someone whose feelings toward her are basically unhappy ones, okay? I mean, it just makes sense. I mean, she she understands enough about God to know that God God is holy, He's perfect, He defines what is good, true, and beautiful. And she's aware of herself to know I'm a sinner, I lose my temper, I make mistakes, I hold grudges, that sort of thing. And so she just can't help but conclude that God is disappointed in me, okay? I mean, she, she knows that to be true about her. Well, what about you? I mean, if I were to ask you, honestly, and not just some theoretical answer because you know it's the right one, I mean, really. Okay, inside your heart, the unspoken answer. If I were to say, Christian, how does God feel about you? I mean, what would you say? Not how does, who is God or what is God, but how does God, Christian, feel about you specifically? I'm telling you, I talk to people inside the church all the time, people who are saved, okay, who would give the exact same answer and who have given the exact same answer that Jenna's given. Just God is perpetually disappointed in me because I always mess up. You know, his his forgiveness has limits. I mean, his love has to have boundaries. We think about God in these categories because our love has boundaries. Our forgiveness has limits. And we, we impose that on God and just simply conclude there's no way. I mean, my, for Jenna, my mom and my dad and my brothers and my friends, I mean, they get, they get tired of me when I mess up over and over and over again. I've told you the story about how Jenna will lose her temper because Kim asks her something so demanding like, would you just do your homework? Okay, and she loses her time, and then she goes on some tirade, I hate you, I hate this family, I want out, you know? And she storms off to her bedroom, and then she comes out five minutes later, head hung low, mommy, I'm so sorry, you know, daddy, I'm so sorry. And for us to say, well, Jenna, you know, it's really hard to believe that you're sorry when you just threw the same temper tantrum 15 minutes ago. Okay, this is the third time today. And then she freaks out again, you guys never forgive me, I hate you, and she runs back to her bedroom, okay? I mean, Jenna intuitively understands that, you know, mom and dad's, mom and dad's limits when they, when it comes to forgiveness and love is different, okay? I mean, there, I can push the boundaries and they say, enough's enough. I don't believe you're sorry, okay? And therefore, I don't forgive you. Uh, God's love, God's forgiveness has no boundaries, has no limits, and so It's very natural for us to conclude, very natural for us to conclude that God is just perpetually disappointed in me. I mean, I've thought about this a lot. I've thought about the fact that I want, especially now because my oldest son Gabe is going off to college next year and, you know, I'm reflecting on the last 18 years of his life and what kind of picture of God have we provided for Gabe? 
I mean, is he gonna is he gonna walk away and go off to college, and when he closes his eyes at night and thinks about God, is he going to think about God as one who is perpetually disappointed in him? Or is he going to close his eyes and think about God as one who, because of what Christ has done, is perpetually pleased with him? Okay. Um, I mean, it's a big difference between those two things. And most Christians I talk to conclude that God is just perpetually angry and displeased with me because they know their own hearts. They know that they've made the same mistake over and over and over and over again. So I want to just take a couple of minutes and answer two questions. What happens when we don't believe all that Paul has said about us? And what happens when we do believe? Because he addresses that in this passage. Dr. Richard Leahy wrote in an article recently, he's uh, um, He's a psychologist, and he actually specializes in anxiety, okay? And he wrote this, amazing statistic. The average high school kid today has the same level of anxiety as the average psychiatric patient in the early 1950s. It's an amazing stat to me. But it's not just high school kids. In 2007, the New York Times reported that three in 10 American women confessed to taking sleeping pills before bed. Okay. In fact, the numbers are so high and unprecedented that some are calling it an epidemic. And as a pastor, as someone who's on the front lines of dealing with people and problems, what I see more than anything else when I talk to people is an unquestioning embrace of performanceism in all sectors of life. Let me explain what I mean. Performanceism is this idea that equates our identity and value directly with our performance. So performanceism defines our achievements not in terms of something we do or don't do, but as something we are or aren't. So the college that teenagers eventually attend will be more than the place where they're educated. They will be labels that define their value as a human being before their peers, in society, before their parents, to each other. I mean, the money we earn, the car we drive, isn't merely reflective of our occupation. It's reflective of us, who we are. What does it say about our value, about our worth, how we look, how intelligent we are, what people think of us is more than descriptive. It's synonymous with our worth. So in a performance world, success equals life and failure equals death. That's why people are stressed. That's the reason why you're stressed. That's the reason why you experience anxiety because at some level, you and I have concluded this whole thing is riding on my shoulders and therefore I have to pull it off. If I am going, if I am ever going to see my life as a success and not a failure, I have to do certain things, I have to become a certain way, and I have to give the impression to the world around me that I am at least accomplished in my area. Okay, so the clothes that we buy, the car that we drive, the things that we pursue, the way that we speak, how intelligent people think we are, all of those things. Okay, are the source of our anxiety, our stress. That's the performance-driven world that we live in. Okay, this is, I mean, in the absence of believing, for instance, that Jesus redeems us and Jesus frees us and Jesus secures us, we burden ourselves to get redemption, freedom, and security on our own. That is what fuels most of our pursuits. Okay, it's not just, I'd like a new car, or I want a new job, or I want this, that, or the other, I want my kids to turn out a certain way, or I want to write a book that a lot of people read, okay? It's not just that, okay? It's, it's much deeper than that. It's, I, if I do not succeed in these areas, I am a failure, so I am, I am out to get freedom and security and redemption on my own. That's what a performance-driven world does to people like you and me. I mean, we, 
We spend our lives frantically propping up our images or our reputation, trying to do it all and do it all well at major cost to ourselves and those we love. And so life for most of us becomes this hamster wheel of endless earning and proving and maintenance and management and controlling. Image management okay, is what we try to do. I mean, performancism causes us to live in a constant state of anxiety, fear, and resentment until we end up either medicating ourselves somehow, in the hospital, depressed, angry, bitter, or just really, really, really unhappy as we make our way through life. That, that's what happens when we don't believe what Paul says about us. So if that's what happens, if if we confine ourselves to a prison of what we can do, what we can accomplish, who we can become, what other people think of us, if, if that's the burden that we put on our own shoulders because of the performance-driven world that we live in, we do that when we fail to believe that all of those things have been already secured for us in Jesus, then what happens when we do believe all that Paul has said is true about us. When, when we believe that everything we long for, we already possess in Christ, we're, we are free to be unloved and loved. Isn't that amazing? You, it, it, it's one thing to be free to love. It's powerful. It's another thing to be free to be unloved without the pressure of going through life saying, I have got to get people to like me. I have got to get people to love me. I mean, when we believe that everything we long for, we already possess in Christ, we're free to love and be unloved. We're free to fail and succeed. Okay, we're not just free to fail, but we're free to succeed without locating our worth and our value either in success or failure. We're, we're free to win and we're free to lose. We are detached from needing those things to establish us and to justify us. We're no longer trapped within the confines of our own efforts and limitations. We become free from the burden of having to extract from people what we need from them in order for us to be happy. Okay, that, that defines most of our relationships. Most of our relationships is a tireless effort to extract from one another what we think we need in order to be happy. And so we're just prodigious manipulators. Prodigious manipulators, you know? I mean, I will, I will talk to my children or I will approach my wife uh, in a certain way because I am trying to extract something from them that I've concluded I need in order to be happy. So it's not just sacrificial love, it's I'm, I'm loving you so that I can get something from you, okay? I mean, we spend a lot of time, we do that. We do that with coworkers, we do that with one another, we do that with our boss, we do it, we do it in life. I mean, we can, the, the kind of freedom that happens when we believe everything that Paul says is true about Christians is we can live without the pressure to perform for our dinner. You know? I mean, most of us are living life stressed out because we're experiencing the, the pressure of performing for our dinner. You know, per, performance precedes acceptance. That accomplishment precedes approval. Approval is what we are really after, and in order to get the approval that we long for, we need to do certain things in order to get it. We, we become liberated from the mandate to manipulate our circumstances and other people's perception of us. It's so tiring, isn't it? Exhausting, absolutely exhausting, to try to manipulate what other people think about us. You know, we just don't want them to see the real us, and so we work so hard to keep the real us at bay so that no one sees it. And then we put on a mask and we portray um, our, as Chris Rock says, our ambassador. Okay, I've said it before. When people meet us, they don't meet us, they meet our ambassador. 
Okay, the one, the one who is doing everything he or she can to convince you that I'm, I'm this kind of a person, when in reality, they're this kind of a person. Well, when we believe everything that Paul says is true about Christians, then we're free from that, okay? This is the spirit of wisdom and knowledge that Paul is talking about in verse 17, when he says in verse 17, um, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom. Okay, that's the, that's the spirit of wisdom that he's talking about. I mean, verses 20 through 23 make it clear that Jesus has already sweepingly secured all that our hearts deeply crave. Okay, I mean, look at, look at the way that he uses the word all and every in these verses. It's beginning in verse 20, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and all. What Paul's saying there is Jesus has sweepingly secured everything we need as Christian people. Everything. There's not one part of what we need that Jesus has not secured for Christians. There's not one. He has sweepingly secured it all. And the wisdom of the Spirit is the wisdom to approach all of life from this vantage point. From the idea that everything I need in Christ I have, so now I can spend my life giving instead of taking. That's freedom. I mean, the wisdom of the Spirit is the wisdom to approach all of life from salvation, not for salvation. The wisdom of the Spirit is the wisdom to approach all of life from our acceptance and not for our acceptance. There is a huge difference between those two things. I mean, the wisdom of the Spirit is living life, navigating our life through a broken world as a broken person and understanding that I'm already accepted. Therefore, I'm not enslaved to the burden of having to go out and get acceptance from God, my peers, my spouse, my children, society at large, whatever. I live my life from my acceptance not for acceptance. I live my life from the vantage point of salvation, not for salvation. I live from my rescue and not for my rescue. I live from the posture of the fact that I've already been eternally loved so that I don't have to go out and try to extract love from other people in order to fill some void in my life that I feel so intensely. I mean, the wisdom of the Spirit is the wisdom of knowing that we no longer need to rely on the position and the prosperity and the preeminence and the power and the praise and the passing pleasures or the popularity that we've so desperately pursued for so long in order to make life worth living. We just, we don't need that anymore because God in Christ has given us everything we need. And then the knowledge He refers to, He doesn't even, He doesn't just refer to the wisdom of the Spirit, but he also refers to the revelation in the knowledge of Him, okay? And when we talk about revelation and knowledge, we have to be specific. It can't just be some general thing, and so Paul gets specific here. And he says the knowledge he refers to is knowledge of Him. It's not some abstract theological proposition. It's not an idea. It's not knowledge of some idea, some ethereal power. It's specifically, he says, knowledge of Him. It's the knowledge of the one who came to do for sinners what sinners could never do for themselves. It's knowledge of someone, not something. It's personal knowledge. It's the knowledge that you are personally loved, that everything you need in Christ you have. That's the knowledge that he's talking about. I mean, the deepest knowledge is the knowledge of grace, which I mentioned when we started this series. For Paul, grace is not some high floating in the clouds idea. Grace is the embodiment of Jesus. 
His person and His work, descending one-way love, God coming to do for us what we could never do for ourselves, giving us everything for free, that God comes and accepts us minus our merit because of what Jesus has done. That's what, when Paul talks about grace, it's not just some theological proposition. He's talking specifically about Jesus, and the deepest knowledge is the knowledge of grace, that seemingly chaotic and cavalier nature of God's too-good-to-be-true one-way love. That's the knowledge that he's talking about, the knowledge that we are inseparably connected to the God of repeat offenders. That's the knowledge he's talking about. I mean, do you, you know that to be true? I mean, that we… Christians were bought by a God of repeat offenders. It's amazing. I mean, I, I literally, I just, this is why I have to be reminded of this stuff all of the time, because I am a repeat offender, and so are you. You might not think you are. I am a repeat offender. Even if I don't, for instance, I look at my, well, I look at my life now, and I compare it from the time I was 21 till now I'm 40. I've been a Christian for 19 years, and I go, I've made, I mean, God has made a lot of changes in me. I mean, I'm, there's lots of things that I used to do that I don't do anymore, lots of bad habits that I used to have that I don't have anymore. And so on the outside, with the way that I live and the way that I behave and the way that I act and the way that I speak, it's very, very different from what I used to be. But that's a far different thing than to say, all that prompted that behavior in my life is now gone forever. I mean, Christians like the Apostle Paul in Romans 7 will still struggle with sin for the rest of their lives. I mean, this is the Apostle Paul, the super saint Apostle Paul who says, I know what I should do because God's law shows me what I should do. I know who I should become because God's law shows me what I should become. And that's a good thing. God's law is good. It shows me what a sanctified life should look like. It shows me what godliness is. The problem is not with God's law. The problem is with me. The things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I know I shouldn't do, those are the things that I keep doing. And he says, oh, wretched man that I am. Who's going to rescue me from this mess that I am? So we, I look at my life and I go, okay, I, I mean, I'm on the outside, okay, if you knew me uh, when I was 19 and you know me now, you'd go, wow. I mean, I'm going to show you a picture. I wish I would have given it, I wish I would have put it up there today. I'm going to show you a picture of me at 17 years old that I showed my wife when we were going through a difficult time with one of our children. And I sent her this picture, some of you have seen it because I tweeted it out. Um, but I sent her this picture and I said, honey, when you really get discouraged and you're despairing over our child, this was me at 17. Now my wife looks at this picture and she goes, if I knew you at 17, I would have had the biggest crush on you. So, <laughs> so for all of you out there who think, boy, Tullian was a real rabble rouser and Kim was this saintly saint. Trust me, if she would have been attracted to that kid. Anyway, um, so I look, if you guys would have known me at 19, you know, um, and you know me now, you'd be like, wow, I mean, huge difference, huge. Um, But I know what's inside my heart. I know how hard it is, as you do, to fight and to just absolutely battle against the internal impulses, the things that I don't want to do. Those are the things that I do and the things that I, the things that I know I ought to do. Those are the things I don't do. I mean, we all struggle with that, okay? All, all the time. And so the, the deepest knowledge Paul talks about here is the knowledge of grace, this idea that Christians live inside an irremovable suit of forgiveness that can never be taken off that we are engaged in a love affair with an unlosable lover. That's huge, okay, huge. And I've said this, I said it, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, but when I was up at Palm Beach Atlantic and sharing some of these things, I said, if you reject Christianity, reject the real thing. Don't reject a caricature of it. 
Don't reject this idea that, you know, the Christian faith and the goodness of the gospel is for clean people who become self-righteous about their cleanliness. Okay, that's not what the Bible presents. Reject this, this idea that for free, because of what Christ has done, Jesus offers sinners. He offers sinners an irremovable suit of forgiveness. He offers a love affair with an unlosable lover. Who, who in their right mind rejects that? No one in your life, no one in my life um, will forgive you, love you, serve you the way that God in Christ has forgiven you and loved you and served you. I mean, that's the knowledge that Paul is talking about, the rightful inheritance of all who believe. And that means that Christian growth does not happen first by behaving better, but by believing better. Oh my gosh. Put that up. Put that picture up. It's back here. Yes. Look at that. Just take a good look at it. Just keep it up there for a minute. It's just being shown online. Um, now listen, this was two years before Kurt Cobain. I was a real trendsetter. That is my hair. That's not Sonny Crockett. Trust me, that's, I don't know what that is. That is a bad, bad boy. Parents, if your daughters bring home a kid that looks like that, okay, you can take it off now. Who, how'd you find that? Who found, that's unbelievable, okay. Ta please take it off there, that screen. I can't stand to look at it for one more second. Thank you. You have to be really, really, really secure in your relationship to Jesus to show that kind of picture in front of a crowd, all right? So, uh, <laughs> it's terrible. So when I sent that to my wife and said, this was me at 17, her tears dried up and said, okay, so we don't have it as bad as your mother had it. Um, but all of this means that Christian growth does not happen by behaving better. It happens first by believing better, believing in bigger, deeper, brighter ways what Jesus has already secured for us. That's what Paul prays for. Okay, it's what he prays. He says, I, what I've just said about you, Ephesian Christians, in verses 3 through 14, is going to be so difficult for you to believe. Okay, it's so otherworldly, it's so radical, it's such a divine vulgarity. Okay, Robert Capon calls grace a divine vulgarity because it just seems so unfair and unjust. We have this intuitive sense of fairness and justice and we look at what God has done for sinners and we go, how could he do that? You know, how in the world could he do that? It's one thing for us to conclude that he can do it for others, but can he do it for me? Me? Well, let me conclude with this. How, so how did it end with Jenna? Okay. And I, I shared with her by her bed that night the only illustration that I know that I've used before in various ways in different places, and I've shared it here before. I said, honey, let me, let me tell you something, or let me, let me kind of give you a picture, tell you a story. Forgive me if you've heard this, but it's, it's one that I always go back to because it's so, so true and it's been helpful for me. I said, let's just say it's dinner time, you know, six o'clock at night, and some stranger comes walking down the street, some guy we don't know comes walking down the street. That guy who you just saw comes walking down the street, okay, walks up our driveway, walks through our front door without knocking first or ringing the doorbell walks into the kitchen where mommy is preparing dinner for us and looks at her and says, so what are we having for dinner? I said, now, mommy's pretty hospitable, okay? She's very hospitable to strangers, but in that particular case, she would probably look at this guy and say, I don't know who you are or how you get, got in here, but if you don't leave immediately, I'm calling the police. Understandably so. I said, now, picture a little bit of a different scene. The same person comes walking down our street around dinner time with Gabe. And up our driveway, 
with Gabe and through our front door without knocking with Gabe and walks into the kitchen and Gabe has his arm around this guy and says, Mom, this is my friend, Stephen. Um, can he stay for dinner? So how do you think mom's reaction would be different? I mean, she would say, Stephen, welcome to our home. And she would get out another placemat and another plate and she would invite him to eat dinner with us and she would treat him like a son. Why? Because he came with Gabe. Do you understand, Christian? You come into the presence of God, not as an enemy, not as a stranger, but because you come with Jesus, you come as a friend, and God treats you as sons and daughters by virtue of what Christ has accomplished on your behalf. You are welcomed, and God, because you are clothed in Christ's righteousness, you are welcomed and appreciated and loved, and God is perpetually pleased with you because you're clothed in Christ's righteousness. Huge difference, okay? You're not, he's not angry and disappointed. Uh, he disciplines those he loves. We will experience the Lord's discipline because he's committed to loving us. He's committed to setting us free from those things that enslave us. But I told Jen, I said, honey, you know, there's a difference between coming into the presence of God without Jesus and with Jesus. When you come into the presence of God without Jesus, then it's, you know, end of the road for you. If you come into the presence of God with Jesus, you are treated as a son, as a co-heir with Christ, and you get all of the blessings that Christ earned for us for free. That's what Paul says embodies the wisdom and the knowledge we need as we make our way through this life as broken people in a broken world. Let's pray together.